Hey there, science peeps! Today we are doing lecture one for the oceans, also known as lecture A, because oceans are the real final frontier. All right, so part one, we're going to be learning strictly about the oceans, such as uh, the oceanic oozes. We're going to be looking at um, what kind of features we see on the ocean floor. It's going to be very exciting. All right, so oceanography. As we should know by now, the graphy part, so like geology, oceanography. It's the study of the oceans. Uh, so oceanographers are scientists who study the ocean. Um, Earth is an ocean world. I don't know if you've heard this before, but we have been called the blue planet. And that is because we are 75% water or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of water, particularly in the southern hemisphere. This is where we have the predominant amount of water. Most of our land is actually in the Northern Hemisphere, believe it or not. Um, so not only are we the only planet to have water in our solar system for now, uh, Jupiter's moon Europa, Ganymede, and Saturn's moon Enceladus all have oceans, and Mars once had an ocean, but ours happens to be a water-based ocean, and we also happen to have life. Which, which, we're not sure about those other planets having life or not. They did make a B-rated movie uh, about that, um, and it was pretty good for a B movie. Uh, they have it on Netflix, and I think it's on about Ganymede or Enceladus. One of them, one of the ice worlds. Anyway, um, so our, our planet is an amazing combination of circumstances. We have air to breathe, we have a good planet size, a good distance from the sun, uh, atoms and water molecules and basically, ah, tranquility. Okay. Remember, we are 71% water. Uh, 97.5 of all of our water is salt water. So our oceans. Only about 22% uh, of all water on Earth is fresh. Um, and yes, that includes water trapped in sea ice because salt doesn't freeze. It actually loses salt when it freezes. It's cool. Um, so the Northern Hemisphere is our most of our land, uh, whereas the Southern Hemisphere, like I said before, is predominantly water. Uh, we do have fresh water locked away in many places. We see it in glaciers, sea ice, uh, permafrost, the atmosphere. Uh, lakes, soil, moisture, wetlands, etc., and of course, groundwater. Um, the most prominent features are in the oceans on Earth. I know we think, oh, but we have all these beautiful mountains on the on land. Yeah, but most of our features are actually underwater. We have mountains that are way taller under the ocean than on land. Um, the average depth of the ocean is about 4.5 times greater than the average land elevation. So we have taller mountains there. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is our oldest basin and Earth's largest feature. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is the largest mountain range on Earth. The And oceanographers are known as also marine scientists. Uh, we have marine geologists who study the crust and composition of the ocean floor. We have physical oceanographers, physical which look at the ocean's dissolved gases and solids. Um, we have climate specialists who use the ocean's role in climate. We have marine biologists, marine engineers who design and construct structures we use in or near the ocean. We will learn about some of these in the second half of the lecture. So uh, the ocean's origins are linked to Earth's origins. Um, we believe that in the beginning, you know, Earth was a molten ball. I'll even draw it. Molten ball, <laughs> right? Uh, we had a lot of impacts uh, hitting towards Earth, which kept us molten. We were spinning. Um, and we had this sun over here, this nice new baby sun, uh, who was like, cool, in the sun. Um, and the sun wasn't necessarily um, anything like the age it is today. It was pretty young. Um, and it's like, yeah, I'm the sun. And we think, oh, there's a possibility that our early atmosphere may have been stripped away if we had one. Okay, because of, well, we're just going to call it sun farting. 
we're actually going to talk about this more in astronomy, so I don't want to get too far into it. Um, and this would have driven away our original, uh, if possible, to have existed atmosphere. Okay. Um, so how did we end up with our atmosphere? Okay, so a combination of these lovely things impacting our planet, which would have had ice. Uh, we also have uh, volcanoes, which would have had degassing or outgassing. Um, and we think that if there was water in the planet, it would have been trapped within, uh, which would have been released in the form of water vapor with volcanic eruptions, uh, comets and meteors. Anyway, eventually the surface of the Earth cooled enough for water condensation to start beginning in basins. Um, and then we see the formation of our atmosphere, which would have created clouds and eventually rain. So there are four major ocean basins. We have the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, and Arctic Ocean. Okay, those are our four major basins. Um, what we have right here, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, we think was at one point a separate basin, but it is slowly being uh, subducted. Um, as the African plate is moving up into the European plate, which is part of why we have all these mountains over here. Um, so that is currently closing. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is currently closing and getting smaller. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean, on the other hand, is spreading. So the Pacific Ocean is our oldest basin that we know of currently. Okay, so it's closing. Which is why we have subduction. The Atlantic Ocean, which has this mid-ocean ocean ridge, is currently opening. It's becoming our new one. Uh, so remember, our last episode of Pangaea had all of these guys together. And so this is starting to spread outwards, which means eventually this side and this side will come together again, and we'll have a new supercontinent eventually. So anyway, how basins formed. Uh, continental crust is much lighter than oceanic crust, like we've learned previously. Oceanic crust is denser than continental crust, therefore it sinks further into the mantle during plate tectonics, where we're going to see subduction zones, um, and so they form divergent plate boundaries and are destroyed at convergent boundaries. Okay, so form at divergent, mid ocean ridge, destroyed at convergent, subduction, whoop. Um, the formation of an ocean basin is known as a Wilson cycle. Bum, 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 the Wilson cycle. Okay, this is the opening and closing of basins. The Pacific Ocean is the largest and with the greatest depth. And the Atlantic Ocean is about half the size of the Pacific and not as deep. Okay, meaning that most of our features are actually in the Pacific Ocean. The Indian Ocean is slightly smaller than the Atlantic uh, and is found in the Southern Hemisphere. And, and the Arctic Ocean is 7% the size of the Pacific, so it is the smallest. Um, so I don't know if you guys noticed, because I don't know if you guys have ever been outside or, I don't know, gone to a beach. Never know. You could have lived in a bubble all your life, like a physical bubble. But it, for those of you who have gone to the beach, uh, I'm sure you have gotten a mouthful of salt water at some time or have gotten water in your mouth somehow. Uh, you'll notice that the ocean is salty. Yes, very salty. Um, and this is because of whales. It is actually because of how much salt has naturally gotten involved in seawater. Um, so the salinity or the saltiness of the ocean or water in general has to do with the amount of solid material dissolved in water. Okay. Uh, so water is predominantly water and then it'll have about 35 parts per million salinity or parts per thousand salinity. Okay, um, this is always going to be expressed as a percent, as far as you know, um, and it's in PPT or this symbol right here, which is parts per thousand, because it is such a small amount of salts. So, um, there are other salts besides typical table salt, you know, sodium chloride. Um, it is the majority, but there are other salts involved. 
Okay. Uh, salinity percentage is about 3.55 on average. And this changes with precipitation and evaporation. Okay, so as more water gets involved, there is less uh, salt per water ratio. And as water evaporates, there is a greater salt to water ratio. Okay, which we're going to see here. Um, so the ocean surface conditions depend on latitude, temperature, and salinity. Um, as the in the tropics, there is a higher temperature, um, little or no rainfall. Uh, so, with precipitation, salinity decreases. With evaporation, salinity increases. Okay. With precipitation, density decreases. And with evaporation, density increases. Okay. There's other bits besides just salinity that'll do it, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But for now, we're focusing on salinity. Uh, so, again, in the tropics. Higher temperatures, little or no rainfall. This leads to an increased salinity. So you're going to have a high surface salinity. This is why you float better in warmer water. Because there's more salt and you are therefore more buoyant. Um, the equator, however, will have heavy rainfall. So you're going to have a lot of fresh water, which means a decrease in salinity. And so a decrease in the density of the surface water, which means you are higher, have a you're going to have a harder time just floating without any help. The polar regions, they are cold, right? So doesn't that mean there shouldn't be as much evaporation? Maybe. But they have something else. They have something called sea ice. So sea ice is very similar to evaporation. When water freezes, it actually loses salt because salt does not freeze. It will precipitate out. Okay? So frozen water leads to an increase in salinity in the water remaining, which means an increase in density. Nice, right? So the source of sea salt is generally the chemical weathering of continental rocks and from volcanic eruptions, which is also known as outgassing. Uh, the composition of seawater has been pretty stable for, for millions of years now. Um, as material is removed, it is generally rapidly added. And this is basically a recipe for artificial seawater, um, which if you make saltwater tanks, I think this is pretty much what you're going to be doing. Uh, so, things to think about. What happens if there is more removal than there is addition? Either you're going to have a rapidly decreasing salinity, or if you're removing water faster than addition, you're going to have a very high density, low amount of water, right? An example of this is actually the Great Salt Lake in Utah. The Great Salt Lake in Utah is having evaporation happen much faster than precipitation or the reintroduction of water, uh, which has resulted in the Great that Lake slowly getting smaller, but getting more and more salty. So if you go there, you will float. Um, the Red Sea is another one. Or the Dead Sea. Dead Sea. Dead Sea is another one. If you look up pictures of the Dead Sea, you just float. So, processes that affect salinity. Well, again, water addition comes from precipitation, runoff from snow, um, melt, um, and icebergs. When your sea ice melts again, it's going to reintroduce fresh water. Um, so, removal, though, removal has to do with evaporation. So, removal. We have evaporation, um, and that's and the formation of sea ice. Addition comes from precipitation, uh, runoff, and melting of said sea ice. So, and this will affect salinity. Okay, uh, so the warmer it is, uh, you're going to actually have a decrease in salinity because you're probably going to have um, in the northern regions especially, you will have runoff due to melting of snow and melting of sea ice. 
Um, in the south, like at the equator, you're going to have a lot of rainfall as it gets warmer and into summer. Um, in the tropics region, like the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, because it doesn't rain so much, as it warms, you're actually going to have an increase. This is why latitude is very important. Okay, so again, zero degrees, this is the equator. We have a very low salinity because of a uh, high temperature. Okay, low salinity at high temperatures versus higher salinity at higher temperatures at like the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. Okay, um, and this is all due to rainfall versus no rainfall melting of sea ice versus and oh, and runoff okay these are all the very important factors so seasons have a lot to do with everything so one of the problems then is actually global warming because this causes a much greater amount of um, melt of sea ice that maybe would not have melted before, for example, the North Pole. Okay, uh, the North Pole isn't actually solid like the South Pole. North Pole is basically a giant ice cap. Okay, um, if we go to the northern areas around here, that's a different story. But this whole area historically basically freezes, and this is why ships have gotten trapped here. Uh, global warming has caused a reduction in how much sea ice forms versus melts in the summer. Uh, so as our North Pole ice cap shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, that means you're having more fresh water in the northern hemisphere or in the in the northern zone. Um, and as we become warmer, less sea ice forms, which does not cause an increase in density. Um, and this can actually really impact the oceans because it impacts currents and it impacts the um, atmospheric changes that we actually have, such as having wetter, rainier summers versus drier winters. So, fun thing here is that we can actually see where the highest amount of discharge is, and it's actually thanks to rivers like the Amazon and the Ganges River, which is super cool, versus the Arabian Sea, which has a lot of salinity. Now we can see this based on uh, where sea ice happens to be forming, um, where you're going to have a lot of evaporation, like around this area, which is where we are seeing uh, the uh, Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, and then our equator is where we have a lot of rainfall. So temperature is very important in the ocean. Uh, and this has to do uh, with how warm or cold it is in the upper layers to the lower layers of the ocean. And this creates something called a thermocline. So the thermocline is the rapid change of temperature with depth. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Uh, so this is essentially a heat slope. Um, it creates a vertical barrier in the ocean column. Um, it's not present at high latitudes. Okay, at high latitudes, there is no thermocline. It doesn't exist. Um, and we consider these isothermal, one th temperature basically throughout. Um, so, where was I? Oh, yes. Um, so what we can see with these graphs here and here uh, is that there's a steep slope that it occurs before a steep drop-off. Um, and this steep drop-off is about the same part where the thermocline is absent, which shows you that that's about the temperature at high latitudes um, versus low latitudes. It becomes very warm. Okay, and this is the thermocline. Uh, it's a barrier in the ocean column where basically between 0 and 1,000 feet you're going to see the most change in temperature. Uh, and this has to do with just the drop in temperature as you go down. It's cool. So the warmer the water is, the less dense it is, versus the colder the water is, the denser it is. 
So density is cool. This is this is the Dead Sea, by the way. <laughs> uh, we've all heard about the Salt Lake in Utah. Same thing. You can't really sink. It's incredibly hard to drown here because you are more buoyant than the water that you are in because it is just so dense because of how much salt it has. Okay. Um, this is an in due to an increase in salinity, which is increasing faster than water is being introduced to the area. Um, we also know that a body of water becomes warmer as it becomes smaller, uh, which is why the Salt Lake feels warm. Haha. -ha. But fun fact to that, increased temperature means a decreased density. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword here. It's increasing in density as it shrinks, but it's also decreasing because of warmth. However, salt density overrides the warmth density. But that's why you will float better in a warm pool than a cold pool. Um, so the other thing is depth. You increase density with depth. Uh, and this is known as the pycnocline, which is the rapid change of density with depth. And again, is not present in high latitudes, which are called isopycnal. So in warmer waters, you will tend to be less in uh the water will be less dense. No. Yes. Ah, in warmer ocean water, which has a higher salt content, especially in our area in Florida, because we are in very close to the Tropic of Cancer, we will have dense, uh, denser water here, which means we are easier to float, at least in the Gulf side, as long as you're not near a runoff zone. And by runoff zone, I mean like where the Mississippi Delta is, because that's where you're going to have less dense because you have a lot of fresh water. Um, and there it'll be a little bit harder to float. But it's kind of cool. Um, so other fun thing is that water decreases when water freezes. Or sorry, the density of water decreases when water freezes. Um, if you haven't noticed, when water freezes, it does something called expanding. Um, and this has to do with the lattice network of ice. Um, so it will have removed all the salts from itself, making it fresh water, which is nice. So see, ice is fresh. Um, and it floats because it is now less dense. But the resulting of said freezing causes the density increase in the water. So fun stuff that is. Uh, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is what the pycnocline looks like. Um, in this case, density increases with depth uh, rather than with salinity. Uh, and so here is your pycnocline. This is where you're going to have a gradual change and then a steep drop. So the ocean can be stratified into three density layers. Uh, you have the surface zone, which is where we tend to be swimming. And... We have the upper layer of the ocean, which contains less dense water, but makes up 2% of the ocean. And then we have the lowest layer, which is where the pycnocline happens. With this, you're going to have a density increase with depth, with 18% of the ocean. And then you have the deep zone. Uh, so your surface zone is up here. It's this pink. Uh, and that's going to be your 2% uh, of the ocean. This is where we swim. Okay, Your transition zone is 18%, and this is the pycnocline or thermocline. And then we have the deep zone. The deep zone is 80% of the ocean. Little changes in density throughout this layer. It's pretty much all density. Oops. Um, so the deep zone is all one density. It makes up 80% of the ocean. Um, and that's where you're going to find um, little to no light coming through. As you go deeper, there's less and less light because it doesn't make it through. Um, so it's pretty cool. You find a lot of cool things down there, which we're going to be talking about when we get to the features on the bottom of the ocean floor. Uh, but let's get to how we map it first. So we use bathymetry to map the ocean floor. 
Um, topography is looking at mountains as they go up, so it always increases. Bathymetry is going down, so it's kind of like the opposite of mountains. It's cool. Bathymetry is very neat. I suggest you all look up a bathymetry map of the Lake Michigan because it is really neat to see. Um, so it's kind of like inverted topography. And we look at this in multiple ways. One of them is echo sounder or sonar. Um, this was invented in the 1920s and it was the primary instrument for measuring depth for a long time. Uh, it uses the same ideas as whales and bats, which is sonar or echolocation. Uh, sound waves are released and they will reflect off of the ocean floor or structures creating a picture. Okay, This is pretty inaccurate over deep depressions though, uh, but it is much better than the original way, which was using a weighted line to measure depth of the ocean floor, which I can't imagine being very accurate ever. Um, so another way is side scan sonar, which is this, this type one. So side scan sonar and multi beam sonar can operate from the same research vessel, which is nice. Uh, but side scan sonar provides a view of the ocean floor. However, it's not bathymetry data. Um, but it is a high resolution um, sonar, and so we're able to see a lot of the features on the ocean floor. It's just not in bathymetry. Um, but high resolution multi beam sonar, which is more accurate, uses up to 121 beams. Um, it can map large areas. It uses an array of sound sources and listening devices. Um, and this can actually map some pretty large areas, and it does come in in bathymetry data. And then we have the satellite altimeter. This is the most accurate. Okay, it uses satellites in orbit around the Earth, um, which uses a radar altimeter. Um, so basically, the idea is that it measures for anomalies in the ocean where it's permanently lifted. So not a wave, but it's like, oh, this water is permanently displaced by like 0.5 degrees. Huh, there must be something there. Uh, so it sounds really weird, but it's the most accurate and precise location um, as you can actually figure out where exactly the satellite is at all times. Uh, so remember, it's not measuring waves. It actually uses an algorithm to determine if an area is permanently displaced um, than the rest of the area around it, which is cool. It's, really, it's kind of neat. Uh, and so this is what we've been able to create with this uh, bathymetry data. Uh, so the lighter blues are where we have our shelves, our continental shapes. This is where we're going to have shallower water. Um, and then our deeper blues and purples, like over here, is where we're going to have the deepest areas, such as the, tr and the trenches in orange. All these trenches are in orange. They are just the best. Um, so what is on the sea floor? Uh, topography of the ocean floor varies actually with location. Who no, knew? No, just like land. Uh, you have two types of margin, the passive margin and the active margin. Uh, passive margins face edges of diverging plates with little volcanic and earthquake activities. Remember, diverging meaning it's growing. Active margins are basically subduction zones. They are located near edges of converging plates uh, where you do have active volcano and earthquake activity. Then we have the ocean basin floor itself where you're going to find sea mounts, which are basically underwater volcanoes, and abyssal plains. Um, and in the mid-ocean ridge, we have rift valleys. So this is a cross-section of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and right here in the middle, we have the mid-ocean ridge. The continental margin, which is pretty smooth, and how it ends on both sides, which is nice. Um, and then we have our deep ocean basin. Ba deep ocean basin. And in the deep ocean basin, you're going to have things like seamounts. You're going to have the flattest parts of the world, which are abyssal plains. Um, you'll have some other really neat things like guy outs and, and um, anyway, we'll, we'll get to them so you can see pictures. Uh, so let's go over what a continental margin is. Remember, two types, active and passive. So aggressive and calm. <laughs> um, passive margins have a much smoother and they have a lot more features on them. So you're going to see 
mid-ocean ridge in the middle between them. They're going to be pretty much found on most of the Atlantic coast versus active being converging places, and they're going to be from pretty much on the Pacific coast. So this is an active continental margin. As you can see, it's pretty crunched up. You're not really seeing um, a continental slope. It's really just... Um, so usually what you have are different parts. So you will have a shelf, a slope, and a rise. And we don't really see that here. It's very small. Here's your slope, here's your uh, slope, and here's your rise. Um, generally, on passives, you're going to have a very gentle slope like this. Very gentle, uh, which is easy for us to stay on. You know, we don't have this random drop-off zone. Uh, remember how I said that on the Pacific Ocean, we have a lot of narrow uh, beaches. This is part of why as well on top of, um, well, I haven't said that yet. So on the Pacific Coast, we have narrow beaches. On the Atlantic Coast, we have wider beaches. This partially has to do with the continental margin. Part of it also has to do with erosion. Um, but our active continental margins, which are going to be on the west coast of the United States, are tectonically active. We're going to have a lot of earthquakes. You're going to have many volcanoes. And they're going to have a high relief, meaning it's going to be really hard to pick out each of the individual features of the continental margin, such as the slope, rise, um, and shelf. Okay. Um, so... It is the continental shelf that does contain most of what we look for in the ocean when it comes to energy, such as oil, okay, and important mineral deposits. Uh, and that's because um, they were eroded during the last ice age. So in the last ice age, we had a drop in sea level because so much water was put in glaciers. Um, which led to pretty much all of this being exposed. So rivers actually came right out on it. They would have continued out to about here. Um, and so you had a lot of plants growing here. You had trees, you had forests, you had animals. So a lot of this, when it died here, got covered by sediment. Sediment came through and covered it all. Okay. Um, and then this sea level rises. You have sea levels coming in. Um, and so this all basically just gets there and goes under extreme pressure. You have some heat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera which leads to oil. And this is why we have oil surging in the Gulf Coast and off the continental coast. Anyway, so oil is generally found in our continental margin. Okay. Um, so after that last ice age, remember sea level rises. Um, so the continental slope itself, which is this bit right here, is where the transition between the rise and the shelf. So this is our shelf. And let's look for it over here. Over here is our shelf. This is our uh, slope. And this is our rise. Yeah, I know it's really hard. Oh, sorry. Rise, slope shelf very tiny versus over here we have this huge shelf this rise or this slope is here and then we have the rise over here okay um and you can really see the difference between them um in the active this break is very abrupt versus the break here is very sloping it's very calm um and your continental rise, which is this part out here, is actually an accumulation of sediment found at the base of the slope. Okay. Um, a lot of this is due to something called turbidity currents, which happen to come through. La, la, la. Turbidity currents are water enters here, and so it keeps going, keeps going. And we have something called submarine canyons. 
right? And that's basically what these turbidity currents come through. And you basically get like an underwater alluvial fan or an underwater delta, but made out of sediment. Um, and so this is very important for bringing sediments out to the rise. You don't really have those out on the Pacific Ocean. So you're not going to get a lot of the sediments from here going out that far from turbidity currents. However, on passive continental margins, which is on the east sides of the U.S., um, sediments coming from land will end up down here on the rise. So you're going to have a lot of uh, terrestrial sediments out here. Um, so these passive continental margins, again, are found mostly along the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, these are not associated with plate boundaries, so there's not a lot of movement here versus active, which has a lot of movement because we have subduction. So we have volcanoes and earthquakes going on all the time. So this is all the information I just talked about, so this is where you have it. Um, but I wanted to go over turbidity currents a bit more. So some continental margins have a topology known as uh, submarine canyons, which are these bits over here. Our little arrows are pointing to them, but they're not very good. Submarine canyons, okay? Um, and what this means is canyons underwater, submarine canyons, ha. Huh. Um, and so these are cut into the shelf slope and terminates at the seafloor in a fan, a fan made out of sediments, okay? Um, which we call deep sea fans. These are essentially alluvial fans, which is, um, if you think about how deltas work, it's like a delta underwater made of sediments. And that's it. Okay. Um, and these are transported by turbidity currents. Okay. All right. So when do these form? They form by turbidity currents. And these occur when turbulence mixes sediments into the water above the slope, which causes the water to increase in density and so sink down, causing these turbidity currents and forming these submarine canyons over time. And this usually has to do with how much runoff you're having. Like river drainage into the ocean, like the Mississippi Delta. Ooh, yes. So active continental margins are the oceanic lithosphere being subducted. Uh, remember, continental crust tends to be less dense, so the oceanic crust is going underneath, and in some cases, older oceanic crust goes underneath younger oceanic crust. But again, found along subduction zones in the ring of fire shark bait. Ooh, ah. um, so accumulations of deformed sediment and the ocean crust form these accretionary wedges, which we see right here. Okay. Um, and over time, because of subduction, uh, these accumulations will actually be forced into the mantle itself because of continued subduction, which will, and then it gets all smushed underneath, thanks to a trench, which is nice. Um, so eventually, these sediments do get transported in, which will have a high water content. They'll also have um, other things mixed in. So when we do have these eruptions, sometimes we find bits of these accretionary wedges in the volcano itself, which is cool. So deep ocean topography, I promised we would talk about it. So we just talked about continental margins and what you'll find there. For example, uh, you'll find submarine canyons and you'll find a, basically deep sea fans, okay, or basically alluvial fans underwater. So the topography of the ocean floor is very different than the topography on the continental crust and on the margins itself. This includes oceanic ridges, hydrothermal vents, abyssal plains and hills, seamounts, guyats, trenches, and island arcs. Okay. Ocean ridges comprise of the mid-ocean ridge and the ring of fire. Uh, and deep ocean trenches are what form at subduction zones. Uh, so a trench is an arc-shaped depression, looks a little bit like a crescent, um, and it's caused by the subduction of diverging ocean plates. Sorry, converging ocean plates. Uh, 
They form mostly around the edges of the Pacific Ocean and forming the Ring of Fire. Um, and these are the deepest places in the crust. For example, the Marianas Trench. Okay. These end up forming your volcanic island arcs, which start as seamounts. So mid-ocean ridges, though, form along divergent plate boundaries and form an elevated sea floor along the broad linear ridge. Uh, these are the longest topographic feature, and they cover about 23% of the surface. Um, and it winds through all major oceans. Basically, there isn't a major ocean that doesn't have part of the mid-ocean ridge in it. Uh, and it's characterized by their elevated position, extensive faulting, and numerous volcanic structures that develop on the new crust, like seamounts. Uh, they consist of layer upon layer of faulted and uplifted basaltic magma and rock. Okay? The Mid-Atlantic Ridge itself has been the most studied out of all of them, which is how we know the most about it. But remember, it is the constant movement up and out of magma. Um, and so mid-ocean ridges such as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge will actually cause movement. So hence, it's pushing this way, which causes subduction on the other side along most of it which is where we get the ring of fire. We also have a spreading center here and a spreading center here, which are other mid-ocean ridges. And this one, this is a race. But we do have subduction here, subduction here, and subduction here. Fun stuff, right? Yeah, 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 lots of fun stuff. I think it's cool. Anyway, so, the one of the ways we can tell what it is, or sorry, one of the ways we can tell what it is, is because of how tall it ends up getting. Uh, so you're going to have this partial melting. There is a rift valley. And as this spreads apart, new magma comes up and kind of like falls over like this. Uh, so it does make a mountain range that's really wide. And it is really cool. So the ring of fire is made up of hydrothermal vents, which are also known as hot smokers hot springs on the active ocean ridges. Uh, superheated water containing dissolved minerals and gas escape through these fissures, which is essentially what these are, they're hot springs, um, and are deposited forming their own structure. And they're really cool. You have a lot of cool things living on here that depend on what comes out of these, all of this. Um, and again, extremophiles. They live here. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's super cool. Super cool. Um, and they think that black smokers don't actually last that long. So the creatures that actually form and live here, we're not quite sure how they get there because they can't survive without the chemicals in the black smokers. Um, and uh, so we're not sure how they pop up or how they get to the next place. But these things will die out in like 20 years less or maybe a little bit more, give or take. And everything that one here, was here will be gone. It will be dead. And then there will be a new black smoker, and that is full of life. And it's really, really cool. Um, so abyssal plains are the most level places on Earth. They are the flattest. Uh, they cover most of the Earth, and they are made up of abyssal plains, uh, which are flat areas of sediment, like here. Super flat. Um, they cover large portions of the ocean floor. They're found in between... Um, Excuse me, they're found in between um, continental margins on, and on ocean ridges itself. They are in all oceans. Um, and then we have abyssal hills. These are small or extinct volcanoes or rock intrusions near an ocean ridge. Um, Seamounts and guyouts are isolated volcanic peaks. Uh, seamounts are projections, and guyouts are basically seamounts that have been eroded into flat tops. And then we have oceanic plateaus, which are generated from vast outpourings of fluid basaltic lavas. And they're cool. They're really flat and tall. So now we're going to get to seafloor sediment. Ooze! Um, so sources of sediment are turbidity currents and sediment settling in the ocean itself. Thickness does vary. It's not all one ease in thickness. So in trenches, you, at 10 kilometers, you will have the thickest oozes, thickest amounts. 
Um, in the Pacific Ocean, you're either going to have 600 meters or less, and the Atlantic Ocean has 500 to 1,000 meters. Mud is the most common sediment on the deep ocean floor, but there are three types of sediment, pterogenous, biogenous, and hydrogenous. Uh, these vary greatly in their appearance and accumulate in loose, unconsolidated forms. So they will vary by size, source, location, and color. And by unconsolidated, I mean they don't go fine to least fine. They're just all mixed up. So I'm sure we have all walked in a lake before, and we all know how that feels. So imagine we're walking on 500 to 1,000 meters of ooze or mud. Like you would just go... So pterogenous sediment actually comes from the continent. It's continental sediment. It is weathered material from continental rocks, and it is the end of the sediment cycle. It is when it reaches the ocean. Um, every part of the ocean has it. Um, these are fine particles of silt and mud, and they will remain suspended for a long time, slowly sinking to the ground. Uh, thick accumulates rapidly and forms thick deposits on the continental margins itself. So if it's um, bigger accumulates, so not fine, um, this is where you're going to get the pterogenous sediment on the continental margins because it's going to filter out much faster. Biogenous sediment, also known as ooze, is made from the skeletons and shells of marine organisms and not living ones, dead ones. Okay? Uh, these are mostly produced by organisms living in the sunlit surface water, basically where you can still see all the colors of the sun. The most common is the calcareous oozes, which are the uh, organisms that contain calcium. Siliceous oozes are composed of skeletons and diatoms and radiolarians and shells. So diatoms are the algae that live in the water. Phosphate-rich materials are derived from bones, teeth, and fish scales. Um, and this is also known as marine snow. It looks pretty. Do not eat it. You are eating dead organisms. Uh, essentially what diatoms look like this is uh, and siliceous oozes it, it's super neat looking um, I will always think this looks like a cotton ball of some sort um, or pom-poms pom-poms uh, but yes this is essentially what makes up all that stuff that's falling from the surface it's cool um, so some marine sediments are both pterogenous and biogenous okay um, the continental shelf is what we call neritic sediment meaning it's mostly pterogenous or from the continental crust um, the slope rise and deep ocean is going to be mostly pelagic sediment, meaning it's mostly biogenous. Um, and different sediments occur in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. In the Atlantic Ocean, you have more calcareous or calcium-rich oozes, whereas in the Pacific, you're going to have more clay and silica-rich oozes. Uh, pelagic sediment varies in composition and thickness. Okay, so turbidites really are deposited by turbidity currents. You have oozes and you have hydrogenous sediments, which are due to chemical reactions that already exist in the sediment, like salt forming. Um, oozes form from the rigid remains of living organisms and my favorite, calcium carbonate accumulates above the uh, compensation depth or a, a part of it. And the rest of marine snow involves mucus and poop. Fun fact of the day. So hydrogenous sediment is really neat. Um, it's minerals that crystallize out of the seawater directly. Um, so you'll have manganese, you'll have calcium, you'll have metal sulfites, and evaporates like salt. All the salt. And so you can find these little nodules at the bottom of the ocean. That's exactly what they are, is nodules of minerals. And it's super cool. So sediment does have other use in climate data. All right. Um, so cat... Carbon dioxide is held in salt water. We do have a lot of salt water, uh, cal uh, uh, carbon dioxide in water, okay? And it's one of the reasons why um, sediment cores are very useful because the algae and uh, dead things will help keep a record of how much oxygen or carbon dioxide is actually in the water itself, okay? Um, and our seawater does hold a lot of carbon dioxide. If the seawater should ever evaporate, for example, when we talk about planets and we talk about Venus um, and how Venus may have had an ocean that may have led to global warming going out of control, 
is if our 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 ocean waters start to hyper evaporate, um, it will release that carbon dioxide, which will increase the amount of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which will cause more evaporation. It's a ruthless cycle. Anyway, we can record these levels over time, which is what climatologists will use it for. Um, and so you can actually record temperature changes in sediment cores and carbon dioxide levels. Carbon dioxide is very interesting. It does combine with water, car causing carbonic acid. So carbonic acid is really important in uh, karst, which is what makes, uh, we're going to learn about this in, one, in the next lecture, actually, uh, which is what creates a lot of the caves, the limestone caves that we have in Florida. That's carbonic acid. Um, so with global warming, you can have an increase in carbon dioxide in the water, which will actually increase the pH of the water, which is not necessarily good for life. Anyway, so if we lose one hydrogen, we get bicarbonate. And if we lose a second one, we get carbonate, which can actually mix with calcium to make calcium carbonate, which is what we find in our hard shell creatures like clams. Um, so in the natural cycle, it is very important for the whole ecosystem of the ocean. However, um, an increase in pH isn't always a good thing. It can be hazardous um, if the water becomes too basic or too acidic. And what they mean by increase in pH of the water here is actually increase in acidity, um, which is bad. However, problems. Increases in photosynthesis due to algae blooms can also increase the pH of water, which is bad. Um, so if we have too much of one or the other in the water, you do get algae blooms. Um, and as we learned recently with our very large red tide that we had of late, that was an algae bloom that is very hazardous. Um, and so having an increase in carbon dioxide in the water can cause these issues, which can lead to too much oxygen in the water, which can also cause issues. Um, so again, very delicate balance in the water. And we need to make sure that we monitor what's going on to see if we're causing issues ourselves, uh, which we can do. Because if we add too much nutrients to the water, it can also cause a very bad algae bloom. Yay. Anyway, so that's the first half of Oceans. Have a great day. <laughs>